Good afternoon, and welcome to Supply Chain Now Radio. We are broadcasting live today from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Scott Luton. I'm your host for today's session. In our webinar today, we'll be gaining valuable perspective on one of the critical challenges facing the supply chain community, as well as the business world in general, the gender pay gap. I'm delighted to have Elba Pereja Gallagher, founder of Show Me 50, on the program with us today. More about Elba in just a minute. But as always, we're glad to have you with us today on Supply Chain Now Radio. So first, let's tackle our ground rules. All attendees will be on mute as we're looking to optimize the audio experience. Now, with that said, let's make it as interactive as possible. So please do submit your questions via the chat toolbar. We'll answer as many as we have time for at the conclusion of today's webinar. Finally, a PDF of today's presentation and the recording will be sent out in the next few days to each of our registrants. So let's take a minute to recognize our sponsors here on Supply Chain Now Radio. Special thanks to our sponsor, Talent Stream, a recruiting and staffing firm that specializes in helping organizations find top talent in the engineering, the manufacturing, and the supply chain space. To learn more, visit us at talentstreamstaffing.com. And special thanks to our sponsor, Apex Atlanta, which has been serving the Metro Atlanta community since 1964. For those of you new to Apex, it is the premier industry association dedicated to end-to-end -end supply chain management. Around the world, our organization serves over 45,000 members. Apex offers membership and professional development, a wide range of education opportunities, industry-leading research and publications, and widely recognized professional certifications. To learn more, visit us at apexatlanta.org. So let's share a little more information about our speaker today. Uh, Elba Preha Gallagher is founder of the social impact organization Show Me 50. The nonprofit's vision is to achieve 50% women in senior leadership positions through a grassroots movement of women and men. As part of their programming, Show Me 50 holds lean-in circle meetings in the metro Atlanta area, which incorporate communication, strategy, and leadership training. Apex Atlanta and Show Me 50 work together to lead change and close the gender gap in the end-to-end -end supply chain industry. Elba is also a finance and strategy professional with over 20 years of experience at UPS. She's held roles in international finance, investor relations, marketing, and strategy. In fact, Elba's pub been published, uh, Elba has published several thought leadership blogs on UPS longitudes. On a personal note, Elba is an incredible resource for our Apex Atlanta chapter, and it's been an absolute pleasure for our board to collaborate with her and Show Me 50 over the last several years. It's really neat to feature Elba and her valuable perspective for the third time on Supply Chain Now Radio. But as always, an important disclaimer, Elba appears in her individual capacity today. Views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are her own. And with all that said, please join me in welcoming Elba Pereja Gallagher. Thank you, Scott. It has been a great experience working with Apex and seeing growth in our membership, uh, particularly seeing more women get involved. And um, it's been a, it's a great experience. So for the audience out there, if you are remotely related to supply chain and no matter what your industry or function, definitely supply chain is key. So hope you'll look into joining Apex and coming out to our meetings both in Atlanta and, and the national organization. So today, Scott, we're going to be talking about IQ, specifically improving our pay gap IQ around pay between men and women. It's in the news oftentimes, and it's a very complicated subject, and I'd like to help all of us get a little smarter. So let's jump in and get started. I do want to briefly mention about Show Me 50. What we do is we incorporate Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In concept and her Lean In circles, which intend to help women improve skills and confidence. But we also believe that it's not just about women leaning in, it's about the organizations, our companies, improving policies and practices and culture uh, to really get to 50% in leadership. And so again, it's a 50% working on your skills, becoming competent, demonstrating your abilities, but 50% is our organizations have got to modernize their cultures and policies to enable true equal opportunity. At Show Me 50, our main goal is to influence change, and what we do is we teach people how to influence change, starting with the root causes, 
the four solutions, and we provide resources for action. So hope people will check out our website, showme50.org, and take a look at how you might utilize these tools to influence change in your organization. Today we are going to talk about these items here. We are going to cover the headline pay gap, no, gap number, which you're going to recognize. It's often in the news. But we're going to start peeling back the onion and talk about the contributing factors, five things that can accelerate progress. We're going to talk about something that called pay gap audits. We're also going to cover federal protections that help us feel more comfortable working with fellow employees to improve pay. And lastly, a skill builder where you can actually learn how to negotiate and we'll, we'll touch on that as well. And there will be a quiz. So everyone pay attention at the end. We'll have a, a quick quiz and see if you have indeed improved your IQ around the gender pay gap. Let's start out with the headline number. So this information is from Lean In is where the image came from. And the Women's Policy Research Institute is where the data came from. We love data. If you look at the difference be between what men and women make, that headline number is that women make about 20% less than men. But we also know a few things about those total averages. For example, five times more engineers are likely to be men, whereas um, women are nine times more likely to be receptioners, receptionists. And if you think about the pay difference between engineers and receptionists, um, you're going to naturally see that that's going to really impact the total numbers. And so it gets really complicated as you peel back the onion on that 20%. We have to examine not just the statistics, the raw data, but we really have to understand what the social behaviors that are underlying those numbers mean. Um, you know, sticking with engineers, as I just mentioned, you know, I think we have to ask ourselves, would businesses be more, um, you know, benefit, would they benefit more from having gender diversity in their engineering workforce? Could women engineers help companies solve problems in new and different ways? And if so, then should companies do more to attract and retain women engineers because it makes good business sense? And so those are the kinds of questions that I think we need to be asking and exploring when we look at these pay gap numbers that we're about to cover in this presentation. We're going to cover numerous statistical sources. One of the main ones is going to be this 2017 analysis from Wells Fargo, where they started breaking down what are the drivers of that headline 20% uh, number. The lead author in this was Diane Shoemaker Krieg, Economics and Strategy at Wells Fargo. And in a supplement to her research publication, she had a Q&A document. And there were two questions I want to touch on. I think the audience will find interesting. She was asked, what are the most surprising results of the study? And what she said is, you know, listen, despite all the advances in technology, all the ability we have to work remotely, the highest paying jobs continue to reward the people who can work the longest and have the least flexible hours. Physically showing up at the office is still, you know, a prerequisite basically for getting ahead in many companies. And that puts primary caregivers, usually working moms, at a big disadvantage. And so that was, you know, that was the biggest surprise she had. The second thing that stuck out to me was, you know, she was asked, why haven't we closed the gender gap? You know, why has progress stalled? And again, back to my comment on it's more than just the numbers. We have to understand the underlying social behaviors. Society just hasn't fully accepted that fixing the problem for women means we also have to fix the problem for men. Both men and women need greater flexibility. They need to feel comfortable taking the time off. But it's still difficult, you know, if you think about men, for men to go in and talk to their employers that they need time off to take their kid to the doctor, you know, uh, or if they're at a barbecue and, you know, they have to admit if they're stay-at-home dad, it's still not as socially acceptable. And so until those, you know, social realities are more accepted, you know, it creates a burden for women. And particularly, I think that organizations miss out on that creativity and, you know, productivity that women could contribute if they were more included and if they were giving more opportunities 
uh, to contribute to the organization. So in this survey and study, they started breaking out what are the contributing factors to that gap of you know, 20 percent between what women make and men make. And these are the big ticket items, career choice, industry and occupation, the experience, you know, how much time are you spending at work day to day? And have you taken any time off any kind of sabbatical, certainly for women raising children? That has a big impact. Education is also an impact. Then there's an other bucket. And then the last bucket, which is a big one, as we'll see, is the unexplained bucket. So we're going to break down that headline number in, in some detail, which I hope the audience will find very interesting and they'll come away from this having a better insight into the number. So Scott, I think now would be a great time to do our first polling survey to keep this interactive. I think great. you've got a question. I sure do. So to our audience, we have several polls for you throughout today's webinar. The first one, which is open now, so please vote. Of 100% of the total wage gap, what percentage is unexplained from a root cause standpoint? So we're going to take the next uh, eight, nine, ten seconds to vote. So please vote now. And Elba will be closing this poll in just a moment, and I'll we'll see what the, what the results. Yeah. So last call no here. It's always interesting to see, you know, well, we know all these contributors, but does it account for 100% of the difference? Mm -hmm. Well, in an interesting note, 38% of our audience chose the third answer, 38%, and 62% 62, 62 of the majority of our audience uh, chose the second answer, 27%. Wow. Okay. Do, 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 do. That's interesting. 38% <laughs> chose the right answer, which is 38%. Right. I think this is a sign that we could be making big, big headway here. Absolutely. <laughs> so, yep, that's true. And you can see in this graphic that if you break down the entire gap between what men and women make by contributing factor, that big top bar is the largest bar and it's unexplained. And we'll, we'll kind of go through that one by one. So if we start at the bottom with education, you're going to notice that it's actually showing up as a negative because there's some pretty positive um, story here, which is that over time, education has been in improving for women. Women are, are graduating at a greater rate um, with graduate degrees and, and entering the workforce, you know, at a higher level of education. And so were it not for that, the gap would even be 6% lower. And so um, education is, is a positive step that we're seeing. The next one is experience. And so again, we touched a little bit on the fact that a lot of times um, women may have to step away from the workforce as the primary caregivers for their young children. And so when you don't work, well, what's happened with everyone else who's still working is they're gaining more experience. And as we know, when you're applying for higher level positions, often it's either education or experience that's looked at as the determining factor for getting a promotion or um, an accelerated special assignment. And so when women have to step away, they lose time. And so again, that negatively impacts and represents about 14% of the total gap between what women and men make. The next biggest chunk, and I put them together because I, I think they really go together, and that's industry and occupation. And we'll cover this a little bit uh, further in, in the next slides. Again, depending on the occupation you choose and the industry sector, that can make a big difference. And I mentioned earlier the example of the engineers and the receptionists, right? If more women are choosing to be receptionists and it's a lower paying job, then it's going to negatively impact the total numbers of, of average pay. And those are big social barriers we have to overcome. We have to ask ourselves, what are we doing to encourage and incentivize women from choosing professions that are higher paying naturally? And of course, the last bucket is the unexplained bucket. And it's the most discouraging because despite controlling for every factor you can imagine, there remains a gap 
and it's difficult to explain why. And so what the researchers do is they come up with just the bucket of unexplained. And that equates to 38%, which um, means that, um, you know, we're not, even when you control for everything, we're still not paid the same. Oh, and I was going to mention, right, still, if you think of it in percentage terms, that 8% is missing from your paycheck. And you know, I've read information that shows that over the, a, li a woman's lifetime, these, this pay gap issue can equate to about $400,000 that they lose out in their economic well-being. So you can imagine if you had an extra 400,000 in your 401k, what would that do for your retirement? How could that help you provide more for your family? So one of the biggest drivers is we talked about how we bucket occupation and industry together, right? Career choice. And so if we know that certain careers and industries make more money, why don't women just choose higher paying jobs, right? It's like common sense. So let's explore a little bit about why that might be. There are three things we're gonna specifically look at. Field of study, then majors within that field, and then the occupation that you choose once you have that major within that field. And so it's this cascading effect that has an exponential negative impact depending on what you're choosing or not choosing. So let's start out by looking at the field of study that you choose. And this information comes from Georgetown Center on Education and the Workplace Workforce, and you can certainly drill into more detail at their website. So more women than ever are majoring, majoring in fields that traditionally are dominated by men. So you know that you've heard the STEM movement. Um, you know, people are trying to encourage more young girls in learning engineering and becoming engineers because they are highly paid and the workforce is evolving to need more engineers. So for example, 17% of workers in the field of women, of engineering are women today. And that's the graphic on the left side. But look back to 1970, it was only 1%. And so one thing I want to, all of us to keep in mind is we are making progress. Things are changing and improving. And so you can see that here. We've gone from 1% women engineers to 17%. So that's good. But women are still disproportionately concentrated in the lower earning field. So teaching, for example, you can see on the right, has pretty much remained steady. And so today, 76% uh, of teachers or women. And of course, we know that the pay of teachers versus engineers is much different. And so that's negatively impacting the, the, the numbers that we see in total. So the next step here is majors within the field of study. So even if you choose to be an engineer, for example, that's not enough because even when they study high paying fields, women are still more likely to choose the least lucrative major within those fields as compared to men. So for example, 30%, 32% of environmental engineer, engineering majors, the lowest paying engineering major are women. Whereas among petroleum engineers, the highest paying engineering major, only 17% are women. Right, so if more women would choose to be uh, petroleum engineers, they're going to be paid more and it would help us raise the total wage gap, that 20%. The challenge is how many women do you know that want to go work in the oil fields and be um, an oil petroleum engineer, right? And so I think those are the social things we have to really examine and explore. Why not? Do we have enough women out there who are in the oil and gas industry, um, raising attention and awareness to you know, the interesting nature of the work. What are the benefits? How the additional compensation helps them provide better for themselves and their families? And furthermore, what can we do if we are an oil and gas company to create cultures that make women feel welcome and included, make them excited about the work that they are contributing? Those are the kinds of things when I talk about 50% of the gap is because women need to lean in and prove themselves, but 50% is what is the company doing to encourage and um, accelerate more women in the higher paying fields? 
So now again, we're cascading down the field of study, then majors within the field, and then lastly, occupation. Because just because you major in one of those um, high paying fields, are you choosing the occupation that actually pays more? And here you see that within the high paying career fields, women generally are less likely to work in the highest paying occupations within that career field. So for example, only 27% of CEOs, 44% of lawyers, and 43% of doctors and surgeons are women. And of course, those are the high paying occupations in those fields. Um, in comparison, if you look at the medical side, um, registered, so if we start on the right side at the bottom, right, it's still the medical field, but 89% of uh, women are nurses, right, versus the bubble above, the high paying people, only 43% of women. The, the middle bubble is the legal field. Again, you can see that 85% of paralegals and legal assistants are women, but the lawyer who gets paid more, only 44%. And of course, lastly, in business, you've got 59% market research and analysts, women versus the CEOs, only 27%. So you can see that even when women choose the right field uh, of study, they end up in choosing occupations that are the lower paying within that field. So again, there's a lot of awareness here that needs to happen young with girls to start talking about it's not only good enough to choose the right field of study, the major, but also the occupation. And I think a lot of us can help um, young people get career counseling that enlightens them to, to the future and how they can improve their economic position by strategically selecting and matching their interests with what good paying jobs. So lastly, that big bucket I talked about, the unexplained bucket, that 38%, um, was all about the unknown, right? That even when women do everything right, meaning they choose the high paying field of study, they pursue a high paying major within that field, they get a job in a high paying occupation, women are still not getting paid the same as their male peers. So this is the concept of same job, right? Same job, not e same pay. So if a man and a woman who are equally qualified get the same job, the woman still only earns 92 cents for every dollar that the man is paid. And so that, that's a far cry from equality. And although you may think, well, gosh, you know, seven, eight cents, you know, what's the big deal? You know, 7%, think of that getting added to your 401k, again, year after year. It does make a difference. Scott, I think we're going to add another poll question here. You know, one of the other contributors we've talked about is experience, and I want to spend a little time here. So I believe that we're going to do a poll question here. Yes, to our audience, our next poll is, uh, is, is open, and please vote now. How many more hours of housework and caregiving do women complete daily versus men? Is it one hour daily? 1.5 hours daily or two hours daily. So please vote now. We'll close the poll in about 10 seconds. Interesting. It'll be interesting to see the responses here, Elba. Um, and last call. Okay, so our responses. 90% uh, of our audience chose two hours daily and 10% of our audience chose 1.5 hours daily. So, um, so Scott, not to put you on the spot, but I know that you okay. have a busy life. You are out there running all kinds of businesses, um, helping the community, and I know your wife is too. So, um, how do you? Where was your answer on this one? Oh, easily two hours daily. Um, you know, Amanda. If I'm busy, Amanda is super busy. So, with three children. Uh, and no shortage of, of uh, chores and things around the house and, and with the family. Uh, it's amazing that she can balance as much. So I, I would say two hours daily, and, and I'm very thankful for that. Yep, that's awesome. But you do a lot, too. I see you out there on social media taking the kids' places and things like that, right? It takes um, – it really takes both partners to um, to make it happen. I know Cheryl Absolutely. Sandberg at, at Facebook is always saying how one of the 
this is really interesting, Scott. She says in her book that one of the most important career decisions you will ever make is what? What would you guess? Uh, choosing to be a parent, maybe. And choosing who your partner is going to be uh, to raise your kids. <laughs> That's a good point. Right, because if your partner is willing to be a true 50-50 partner, you're going to see in this example why that's so important. So what was the answer, Scott, to this? Did you say that already? I didn't. I was going to uh, save that for you. Okay. It's one hour, right? So on average, now keep in mind, right, this is the entire, um, you know, workforce um, that generally women are spending about one hour more working in the house, um, you know, doing all their family care duties um, than men. And so here's a chart. This comes um, from a combination of the Wells Fargo study and the American Association of University Women, who's, by the way, been around since 1818, or no, 1881, sorry, 1881. And they are advocates for, you know, how can we improve the economics um, for working women. And so you can see here on the left that women spend about one more hour every day on family care and housework. So among full-time workers, men work longer hours on average than do women. However, on average, women do more housework and care work than men. And so if you think about it, those longer hours that men are at work, what this study says is that they're essentially being subsidized and facilitated by unpaid labor done by women, which is contributing to the gender gap. And so just to explore this a little bit further, right, make sure we're all understanding this. Men are at work staying longer because their wives have left work to go take care of the, you know, the dinner, the family, picking up the kids, what have you, and that, you know, that work is unpaid. And that's subsidizing the fact that the man is at the office putting in that face time, getting more opportunities to demonstrate their skills, you know, getting potentially more visibility, and that produces more, um, you know, upward mobility from a career perspective. And so this is one of those social behavior issues that's a little touchy. I mean, not everyone agrees with this. And of course, these are average numbers. Of course, there are situations where they're stay-at-home dads. There are 50-50 partnerships where men are absolutely doing 50% of everything. I see it and I'm so encouraged, especially among, um, among the younger workforce. I see definitely greater sharing of those um, housework and family care duties. And so that's very refreshing. But on average, it, it's still this experience situation has a negative impact and creates that gap. Another interesting graphic here is around age. And so, you know, age is another one of those others that really is interesting to examine. So what this graph is showing, women are orange and the men are blue, and this is over time, and it's talking about what is um, the gap between wages between men and women. The pay gap grows with age. So the older you get, not surprisingly for anyone, men or women, um, you know, you're earnings decline. And you can see that, you know, over time, you know, especially over at the top 55 and over wages are declining for both men and women. But these are 2016 example here, women that were aged 20 to 24. So it's that second um, circle. I put the red arrow there. When they're that, that age in 2016, women were paid 96% of men's pay. So it's not that, you know, there's not that much of a gap. But if you look at that same year, but women who were 50, or people who were 55 to 64 years old, now women's pay is only 74% of men's pay. And so what happens is that not only are total wages declining as you get older, but the gap between men and women grew. And so it's bigger versus when you're a young person. So it's another, you know, another strike against us the older we get and something to be aware of. But as you'll see later, there are things that we can do, both as individuals and as organizations. 
So what is it that we can do? So we're going to talk a little bit about solutions because I think it's important not to just talk about what the challenges that we're facing, but what we can do about it. So in supply chain, we love acronyms. We love to put acronyms on everything. And so I've got one for you here because this has to do with how are we going to solve this problem. So Scott, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Sorry. Uh -oh. um, take a stab at what this thing Sydney could be. And this Sydney is a real concept around problem solving. And it's about the most difficult problems to solve. And we took, talked a little bit earlier about how we're peeling back the onion. Um, take a stab at what you think the C could stand for in very challenging problems. And it's not challenging, so. <laughs> <laughs> well. So peeling back this onion, what do you think the C could be? So before you said it was a problem solving framework, I was thinking it might be an acronym for a new chief level executive. But um, oh. if, if, the chief, if, the, if the C is not challenging, when I think of problems, uh, could it be uh, maybe calendar related or um, uh, maybe complexity? Yes. Ding, 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 ding. Complexity. <laughs> And this, that's what this problem is. It is so complex. There's so many variables, right? There's not just one thing, it's multiple things and they move up and down and it's so challenging. And so what Sydney stands for is complex, ill-defined, non-immediate. Complex, ill-defined, non-immediate. When a problem is complex, it's ill-defined and it's non-immediate, meaning there's no burning platform. There's no burning platform saying, oh, we've got to cover this 20% wage gap, right? It's so hard to solve these problems because no one feels a compelling need to do something. And if, even if they did, they don't even know where to begin. And so one thing we're trying to do at Show Me 50 is not only raise awareness and educate people and teach them how to be collaborative in influencing change, but we're giving them some tools to do that. And so we're going to talk about in this slide, what is it that we can do to work on all those complexities that we looked at when we were peeling back the onion. So here are five things. So five, not too bad, not too bad to keep in, keep remembering. Um, number one are pay gap audits. Number two is flexible working for men and women. And, and you remember that was one of the questions that was posed to the woman who was the author of that study, right? One of the things she found most surprising was gosh, all this technology and flexible working, and yet we can't seem to get past the social norm of demanding that you be in the office all times a day just to be seen as um, a future high-level manager. Number three is inclusive workplace cultures. And this is so critical to encouraging girls and women to not only enter those high-paying fields, but to stay in them. Number four is absolutely one of my favorites, transparent and objective talent management practices with controls for unconscious bias. I work in finance. I'm very exposed to the importance of transparency from both a risk mitigating area um, and for just understanding clearly what's in front of you. If you think about the Securities and Exchange Commission. You may remember from my bio, I worked in investor relations. You know, the SEC has rules about information that must be provided to all investors. Why is that? Why is that transparency important? It's because in order to have a level playing field, everyone should have information and access to the same information, transparency. Also, another one that is a great example is the procurement process. If, if we all think about, certainly in supply chain, either as a person who's um, providing services and going through the procurement process, or if you are on the receiving end and trying to um, get a contract with a company, a critical part of fair procurement is that there are rules and that everyone have access to the same information. So at most companies, when you're engaged in a contract procurement process, there are rules that say, hey, look, you can't give this vendor any different kind of information than you give to this other vendor, because that wouldn't be fair, right? Both vendors need to have the same requirements, the same access to people to ask questions. Otherwise, one has an advantage over another. And so a critical part of breaking through this gender pay gap, and frankly, all of the um, lack of um, leadership 
uh, women representation is transparency and controls for unconscious bias because we don't mean to be biased. We don't mean to pick people that are just like us. We think that we're being completely fair, uh, but unless you could have a truly blind uh, promotion and selection process where you wouldn't see names or uh, genders or races of people, you, you naturally human beings are are biased. And then the last one, which is super critical, is executive accountability. And so we're going to talk real quickly about particularly executive accountability. Great example is this guy here, Mark Benioff, who's the CEO of Salesforce.com, Salesforce. This is from a 60 minutes, 13 minute segment, which I encourage everyone to go out and search for. It aired back in April, and he basically talked about what he's doing as an executive to address this gender pay gap. Because what's happened, even though he fixed it once for 3 million bucks, a few years later, they bought new companies and he found they still had a gender pay gap. So it's so persistent if you don't keep your eye on it. And that's really what executive accountability and leadership is all about. Doing pay gap audits and then reconciling and, and making right by paying men and women who are doing similar work the same amount. So let's talk a little bit about what gender pay gap audits are. So this information is all sourced from SHRM, the Society for Human Resources Management, and they are the premier organization that provides education and certification in the HR field. And so if you have access to the SHRM database, I would encourage you to go find this paper. It's from 2015, it's called Managing Pay Equity. It's an outstanding paper that summarizes the nitty gritty and the behind the scenes of managing pay within companies. So again, the purpose of this webinar is to give you a little education and improve your IQ, and you're going to get that from this slide alone. So it's important to recognize that there are milestones where the pay gap will impact your pay. Starting pay is the first one. Then merit pay increases, which happen along the way of your career. And then lastly, promotional pay increases increases. So think about the fact that when you start, particularly for women, the studies and the research shows that women tend to not negotiate as much, sometimes at all. And if they do negotiate, they ask for less than men who are negotiating for the similar work. So once you start out at a lower pay, you can only imagine over time, you're never going to catch up. You're always behind. Merit pay increases, again, same story. Are you negotiating for a, an appropriate merit pay increase? And PS, is the process for getting the merit pay increases transparent and objective? And are there checks and balances to ensure that when you're evaluated, that you are being evaluated fairly? Are all the managers in the company using the same methods? You know, is one person more lenient than another person? You happen to be working for the harder person, and so your merit pay is going to be less than someone else. Um, promotional pay increases, same thing. Again, when you get a promotion, depending on who your manager is, they have some discretion. Are they giving you more or less? Another important thing I want to point out is that, you know, pay differences can be legal. You know, absolutely. You pay people depending on what they're what they bring, right? And so there are there are lots of things that you can essentially um, differentiate with pay: a seniority system, um, the merit system, quantity or quality of production, and then any differential based on a factor other than sex. Um, so. I think those are key things, important things to understand. And Scott, I think I did. I have one more um, poll question in this slide, perhaps. We sure do. I will okay, watch let's take that a look now. at now. So, to our audience, true or false? Reducing managerial discretion in pay decisions reduces risk of pay discrimination. So, please vote now. We'll leave this open for ten seconds or so. We've got a difference of opinion here. Right now, we're 50-50 in our audience, believe it or not. I like 50-50. Yeah. <laughs> you know call. what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Last call. Okay, so we had about 63% of our audience vote, and the breakdown was close. So 58% uh, 
uh, of our audience agreed with that statement and, and, and called it true, and 42% disagreed and, and said it was false. Got it. So not surprising, there's a lot of polarization, right? <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, so we're split. No, but that's pretty good, that's pretty good. So, so they got the 68, did you say 68% was true? 58% of our audience uh, chose 58%. true, yep. It was true. Okay, yep, and that's the answer. So good job, audience. Um, this one's a real interesting one, and certainly as leaders and managers who have, you know, worked over time real hard to get to where we are, and we're finally the boss and in charge. Um, we, we like to be in control of our teams and, you know, use our management, managerial discretion. That's why you get to be a leader. But it's absolutely true that the more managerial discretion is given to someone, the greater the risk there is for discrimination. Because again, back to this unconscious bias, we're humans, I'm biased. I'm, if you can believe this, even though I am a huge advocate for women and I'm so well educated on all the topics, I catch myself being unconscious bias you know, in certain circumstances. So it happens to all of us. So um, the risk areas for organizations are the degree of distress, discretion that is exercised by decision makers. So the more discretion, the greater the risk. Um, another risk area is checks and balances on discretion. If an organization does not have systemic checks and balances on their management team's discretion over pay, you are asking for higher risk. Um, and then the last one is monitoring of discretion. If your organization is not monitoring pay decisions, they're going to be at greater risk. And so the challenging area here is, again, you're, you're going to a leader who may be, let's say, you know, real high lead, leader, who's done excellent work through their career, uh, who delivers for the company all the time, and now you're gonna tell them, oh, John, you know, HR is gonna come along and double check the decisions that you're making when it comes to pay. And well, why did you rate this person this way? And why are you starting their pay here? Why on this promotion are you giving them this promotion? You know, in the past, you know, managers had a great deal of discretion and they would just say, hey, I'm in charge, mind your own business. <laughs> but there's been plenty of lawsuits and plenty of challenges for organizations that require HR departments and um, legal departments to demand a greater control and checks and balances over pay decisions. So if at your company there isn't that going on, then you're probably at a greater um, likelihood that there are more pay gaps. And so the, the, again, this slide was all about, hey, what can we do? How do these pay gaps work? So what companies need to do is to reduce managerial discretion. Right, they need to take a little bit more control about who gets paid what when. Double checking that when you know merit pay increases are done, that there's a complete written record of the decisions. Why are they you know rating this person this way? You know, is there enough information? Is it a neutral or a unbiased decision? Because it can make a big difference, especially for women. And, you know, in the end, you end up with that $400,000 less over your lifetime because little slices along the way have cut out um, pay increases that you could have been awarded. And then lastly is monitoring of compliance with policies is you may have a great system in place electronically or otherwise that tells managers, hey, this is the right way to evaluate people. But is anyone from HR or at legal going back and saying, hey, are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Have you filled out this file? Have you submitted this electronic record? So I think monitoring compliance is important. Another thing that we need to do if we wanna change the trajectory of this pay gap is we need to talk about it. Just like having this webinar, we need to get a little more comfortable about these topics and having open, honest dialogue and sharing our points of view about pay. It's okay to talk about it. Um, and we need to talk about it more and it needs to be both men and women. So did you know that women are four times less likely to ask for a raise compared to men? And when they do ask, women typically request 30% less and are viewed more negatively than 
men asking for a raise. And, you know, these are some of those social norms. I'm sure that uh, both men and women out there can relate to the concept that when, you know, if a woman acts too aggressive or, um, you know, is too bossy, it, it's a negative thing, right? But when a man may take control of a meeting and come in with a, a definite agenda and very intentional about what he wants done, he may be viewed as, hey, he takes control, he knows what he wants, he can get it done. And so those social aspects in our culture really need to be evaluated and we need to be introspective and, and ask ourselves, wow, am I jumping to a conclusion about somebody that I shouldn't be? The more we talk about, about it, the better it can all be for everyone. So here's a few um, public examples. Certainly we see celebrities all the time talking about the gender pay gap. In this case, th these are all pretty recently this year. Mark Wahlberg, the actor, was paid $1.5 million for reshoots for the movie All Money, All the Money. But Michelle Williams only got paid a thousand for the reshoots. And what was interesting about this one, it, it kind of goes back to negotiation and the fact that we don't talk and that we're not as engaged. Uh, from what I read, it turns out that Mark Wahlberg's contract specifically laid out, hey, if there are going to be reshoots, then this is the rates we want. But in Michelle Williams' contract, they didn't negotiate that type of um, arrangement. So she just kind of got the default, you know, basic sort of minimum wage <laughs> type pay. So talking and negotiating is important. In the upper right, there's a picture. Um, I don't know if you guys watch this. I, I believe this is Netflix, a show called The Crown. And the woman there, Claire Foy, plays the queen, Queen Elizabeth. And it's the the show is really led by her is the main character but yet she was getting paid much less than the guy playing prince philip and again that was in the news and then lastly you see nike um, in the uk they've got some rules now that you have to declare the pay between men and women and you have to report on it and here here the hr chief at nike in the uk was saying that um you know UK men earn 10% more in hourly pay than women who worked in the wholesale division. Men earned 3% more than women who work in the retail. And, you know, here's a key that they attribute that the average pay discrepancy to having fewer women in higher paying senior level positions. So just as we were talking earlier that, you know, women are in lower paying jobs and careers and industries. Um, and in this case, within organizations, I think it's incumbent and required of organizations to do more to level the playing field to do things like the sec and procurement departments to provide more transparency so that everyone knows about opportunities and can compete fairly based on knowing what programs are that lead to those promotions so one more example of kind of talking about it and how we talk about the pay gap is this example. So I run a lot of, through our lean in circles, we have a lot of great engagements with men and women. And we run a lot of um, post-it notes and, and take people's true feelings on things. So um, some men say around the pay gap that, hey, you need to focus on your own progress. Don't, you know, worry about what other people are getting paid. Put your head down, do your work, and things will take care of themselves, right? Quit focusing so much on this gender pay gap then. Well, back in October of 2014, the CEO of Microsoft um, kind of said the same thing. He then had to come back and apologize. What he said was, you'll see they're kind of in the middle, Nadella said that women should just trust karma instead of asking for pay raises. He suggested that the system would reward their work. But of course, we all know from reading all the, uh, the papers and the research that it's just wrong you don't just get rewarded. You can't just put your head down. You have to do more than that. And so he came out and apologized. And on the right, you see a statement from Sheryl Sandberg uh, at Facebook. She's the one that started the Lean In movement. And you know, she points out that women who ask for a higher salary are typically viewed as more demanding than men who do the same thing. Aggressive and hard charging women violate the unwritten rules about acceptable social conduct men are continually continually applauded for being ambitious and powerful and successful but women who display these same traits often pay a social penalty 
Uh, and so female accomplishments come at a cost. But I think that, you know, we still have to um, be vocal, be transparent, be willing to have these uncomfortable conversations to help us um, advance change. Another thing I've heard in our focus groups that we do with Show Me 50 is that this is this is a comment from a woman. I want to fight for myself, but I'm afraid of retaliation or being labeled. And I totally get that. I trust me, I am terrified most days of talking about Show Me 50, talking about the opportunities that we need to work together to improve for women. So I get it. Um, I think we need to be not only a little brave, but also a little educated. So I wanted to share with everyone some basic rules that really protect us in our interest to improve working conditions for us, our coworkers, and frankly, our companies. I think this is a collaborative movement. We want companies to do better by having more diversity of thought and including not just 50% of the workforce, but 100% of the workforce, which means including um, all the women and their capabilities. So the National Labor Relations Board provides some employee rights that I don't know if everyone is aware of. You know, we're all in management. If you are in management and you think that, well, gosh, you know, we have no rights. So um, the National Re Labor Relations Act um, provides rights, this is in the middle of the slide, to employees to engage in concerted activity, which is when two or more employees take action for their mutual aid or protection regarding terms and conditions of employment. Um, you know, single employees can engage in activity if they're acting on authority from other employees or trying to bring groups together to, to prepare for influencing change. And some of the examples of activities, and the one I wanted to point out to you, is the first bullet addressing their employer about improving their pay. So this is a protected activity, legally speaking. Another area where we have some protection is from the Department of Labor. They have um, a policy that's pay transparency policy statement. And so if your company does any business with the government as a contractor, right? So you, your company works with the government, they have a contract to provide services to the government, which by the way, is gonna be just about every major company. Um, they must post what you see here on the screen. This is the official pay transparency policy statement. You can go to your company's employment website, uh, maybe they're, you know, where they post and uh, open jobs and, dig around in there and you're gonna find they post it on here that they will not discharge or in any other man manner discriminate against employees because they have inquired about their pay or the pay of other employees. So as we start to wrap this up, I wanna repeat that one of the solutions, in addition to what I mentioned where you've got the, those five things, including executive accountability and um, gender pay gap, get gender, pay audits, we've got to keep talking and we have to learn to negotiate. Because remember there were those three milestone areas where we are negatively impacted, starting pay, merit pay, and promotion pay. You have to learn to negotiate at each one. So I wanna share with you a great tutorial free website out there. This again comes from the American Association of University Women and it's what's called a salary skill builder. And it's super short, it's very interesting to scan through it, but it teaches you some basic negotiation skills and it actually en enables you to write down and practice the words you will use when you are negotiating your pay at those three milestone areas. And by the way, this is not just for women. I talk about this all the time. And Scott mentioned it early on that, you know, show me 50 and, and my philosophy is that it's not just about women. Men and women have to work together and men, also are negatively impacted by pay discrepancies. Um, you know, it depends on your personality and your, if you're different from the rest of the men in your organization, you also will suffer. So um, check out this negotiation skill builder, it's great. Okay, so last thing we're gonna do, this was an IQ workshop and we're gonna see if your IQ has worked, so uh, has improved. So Scott, I think you're gonna help me here. Let's kind of go through a few questions real quick and see um, if we can recap what we learned in today's webinar. So number one, equality is 50% you leaning in and 50% what? Company policy and culture change. That's right. 
you know, and that's why I love that 50, 50, right. And I, we hear about this in our career development. Look, you've got to do your part. The company's just not going to hand you a brand new promotion. You've got to go prove yourself. Um, but the company has to do their part. Okay. The headline gender pay gap number, right? So this is the gap in percentage terms. What is that? I'm gonna say 20%. Yep. 20%. And so everybody who's listening out there, see if you can remember um, from your notes or from just having listened. So number three, half of the explainable gap factors, one of the biggest ones, half of them were from industry and what choices? Uh, occupation choices. That's right. So um, what industry you choose to work in and study and occupation. Um, even women that choose the higher paying field of study, pursue higher paying majors in that field and get a job in a high paying occupation. This is the discouraging part. Even when you normalize for all of that and you're on the seven, seven, same playing field, same fields and occupations, women still are only paid what percent of their male peers? Uh, this one stood out for me. I remember the eight cents per hour, so That's 92%. Right. That's exactly right. And again, I said that, you know, hey, that eight cents or eight percent, think of that every year in your paycheck over time. You know, it's a lot. Sure. Um, number five, women spend about how much more on housework and child care than men do. And this is a two part question. Um, it said that men's longer work hours are subsidized and facilitated by what, which contributes to the gender pay gap. So the first blank is one hour. That one certainly stood out. The second, um, uh, women's unpaid labor. That's right, because they're doing all that housework for free. And right. so it's subsidizing the guys who get to stay at work and you know, get more face time and lead to more pay and promotion. The pay gap grows with age. So young women were paid blank percent of men's pay, but once you get older, 55 to 64, you're only at 74%. So the young women get what percent of pay? Now, this was encouraging, 96% at the earlier stages. So hopefully that reflects a mindset uh, change and evolution. I, I don't know. I know, yeah. I hope that that can, can, can continue, right, that we right. don't open up the gap as age persists. Um, oh, five things that can accelerate pay equity. Ooh, I'm going to challenge you on this one. I have to name <laughs> five things. This one was the one with the picture of um, Mark Benioff. Okay, so the first one, uh, the pay gap audits that stood out, um, uh, flex flexibility is always important. Um, yeah. Thirdly, uh, inclusive workplace cultures. That certainly the the in inclusivity is is a phrase that I've I've come to to know and hold dearly the last couple of years working with you, Elba. Uh, mm -hmm. Transparency is a big big factor there. Transparent and objective talent management practices. Uh, with controls for unconscious bias, we've got a question from the audience on the latter point oh, there. Awesome. Okay. Um, and then finally, of course, it starts at the top: executive accountability. Yep. Cool. Okay. Let's race through these real quick so we can get to that question. Um, three major milestones where pay issues happen: uh, your starting pay, merit pay increases, and promotional pay increases. That's right. And then four reasons that can legally justify pay differences: uh, a, senior, a seniority system a merit system, quantity or quality of production, and of course, differential based on a factor other than sex. That's right. Okay, three ways to reduce pay discrimination are? Uh, number one, reduce managerial discretion, right? Number two, provide more complete written record of decisions. And thirdly, improve monitoring of compliance with policies. Yeah. Okay. We're down to the last three questions. So women are four times more likely, um, less likely, I wish four times more, less likely to ask for a raise. And then when they do ask, they're typically only get, requesting what percent and are viewed more negatively. Believe it or not, 30% less. Yep. 30% less. Wow. Um, okay. So true or false, the National Labor Relations Act protects the rights of management employees to work together to improve working conditions, including improving their pay. Absolutely true. True. And last question, practicing what skill is an effective way to improve your pay? Negotiation, of course. The negotiation, of negotiation skills. That's right. Okay. So awesome. I hope your audience has found this helpful. And I think we probably have time for one question, maybe. Sure. Um, so question from Janine here. Uh, you spoke about unconscious decisions that you personally became aware of in your own experience, Elba. Would you provide an example of one of those situations? 
oh, I've got an ugly one. And look, I'm telling you, we've got to get more comfortable with being uncomfortable. So I'm going to get real uncomfortable and tell you this is a true story, right? Um, I had a situation where um, there was a there was a business trip coming, and you know it's it was a great opportunity for for a business trip. And someone asked me um, about, hey, you know maybe we should send this person. Happens to be a woman, and I'm I can't even believe that this happened because I am a huge advocate for women. And what did I do? I said, oh well, I happen to know that that woman, you know, has these small children. She's probably not going to be able to go. So instead, let's send this other person. So when you talk about unconscious bias, that's kind of a clear cut example where we say and do things that we don't even think about until afterwards. And it's like, oh, what did I just say? Right. So what we have to do as individuals, as leaders, is to be on the lookout for that. Um, a couple of ways that we can check ourselves is before we answer a question about advancement opportunities, about merit pay, about, you know, things like that, before you say anything, think to yourself, okay, remember the gender gap, you know, we want to make sure we're being completely neutral. Why am I going to jump to certain conclusions? So I think th that's an example of the things that, um, that are unconscious. Great right, question. Another, yeah, another one is around pregnancy. I think a lot of times, this hasn't happened to me, but I've, I've seen situations where people are like, oh, well, you know, she's pregnant and, you know, I'm, I don't want to promote her because she's going to be gone for, you know, two months or what have you. And so that's another example of biases that we can't let um, get in the way. Mm, great point. It's a great question, Janine. Uh, Elba, uh, we are running out of time. Just to our audience, uh, Elba's great. She enjoys comparing notes. We'll make sure you have Elba's contact information and the follow-up information that will go out along with the recording and the PDF of the presentation. But Elba, I do want to pose one question to you. I think this is really neat. In our warm-up conversation, you shared some news with me. Um, I understand that you were invited to Chicago as part of Apex, uh, Apex 2018, which is a big international conference. It takes place once a year. Uh, September 30th, you're going to be leading a breakout session. What are you going to be talking about up in Chicago? I'm super excited because I love the Windy City. Um, so yeah, I'll be there on uh, Sunday, September the 30th. I'm going to be talking about interesting topic, especially for supply chain folks. It, it marries up innovation with project selection. So as we, you know, we're every business and industry is being challenged by what's going on in the marketplace and uh, competitors that we previously may not have thought of. And so what I'm going to talk about is how do you, number one, come up with ideas that are executable, but as an organization, how do you prioritize things? How do you ensure that you're adding positive shareholder value? So it's, it's a combination of innovation and my finance background to really help people improve their business acumen and, and their financial acumen and pitching their, um, their innovation and change projects. Hmm. Well, what an honor uh, for you, uh, Elba, but also what a great gain for the Apex Conference. Um, you know, they, they really feature the best of the best speakers within the supply chain industry, so Elba fits right into that. So to all of our audience, if you're attending the International Apex Conference in Chicago in the fall, late September, early October, make sure to uh, take in Elba's breakout session. So um, Elba, uh, thanks for your time and perspective today. Uh, we're going to be concluding our session this afternoon on a few final items. You know, first, we want to invite our audience to join us for one of our up upcoming webinars. A bunch of different intriguing sessions on the docket from uh, attracting top supply chain talent to a warehouse industry workforce update, many more. Learn, learn about each session at apixatlanta.org. Secondly, if you're in the state of Georgia and you want to engage the next generation of students, we'd welcome you to join us for our Supply Chain 101 initiative, where we're taking teams of volunteers into elementary schools to talk supply chain with students. Contact us for more information. Also, if you're interested, speaking of APICS, if you're interested in pursuing a supply chain management certification, be sure to check out our APIX Atlanta CSCP and CLTD boot camps that are taking place next week at Georgia Tech. Um, and finally, if you're interested in learning best practices on reverse logistics and sustainability from an industry leader, uh, join APIX Atlanta and the Reverse Logistics Association. For
for a special one-day seminar at the Home Depot Returns Facility in McDonough, Georgia on August 16th. You can email me for more information on that note. And, of course, feel free to reach out to me if there's anything else we can do to serve as a resource for you uh, and your organization. So, Elba, before we conclude today's session, any final thoughts on your end? You know, I would just say that I hope that people take this information and share it, share it with men and women, help people um, improve their IQ on the issues that we face in terms of gender diversity at work. And lastly, you know, check out Show Me 50. We're trying to start new Lean In Circles. We have all the content and would love for someone to start a Show Me 50 Lean In Circle in your neighborhood and um, start sharing some of this fantastic uh, business, leadership, and uh, change influencing information. Mm. And we all always need more volunteer leaders. Uh, what a great thing for your professional development. So reach out to Elba if you're interested. And again, showme50.org is her URL. So as we wrap up today, we'd like to give a big thanks to our guest speaker, Elba Pereja Gallagher of Show Me 50 for this presentation and all of her valuable insight. Big thanks to our sponsors again, Apex Atlanta and Talent Stream. Of course, a big thank you to our audience for participating. On behalf of Supply Chain Now Radio, this is Scott Luton concluding today's episode. Have a wonderful week, and we hope to reconnect again with you real soon. Thanks, everybody.